And now, to top it off, we're watching probably one of the greatest comedic movies of recent times, Elvis and Nixon. Because I knew, when I first saw this movie the trailer, I thought, oh my God, I am not going to be able to handle this one. I'm going to be laughing. And so I'm, I'm on the runway, they're getting ready to, on the runway, and I, and I got bumped up from economy to first class tickets. So I'm in my first class that I got bumped up into at the last second. And then I'm there looking at the movies, and I'm like, oh my God, it's, it's Jesus. No, it's, it's Jesus doing it, and it's Elvis and Nixon. And I thought, I am gonna, I'm going to lose it. I, they're going to throw me off the plane. And it was just as funny as I thought, because it's like people pleasing to the max. Power, fame, money, prestige. The king of rock and roll wanting to go to the White House. They, at the end of the movie you see Nixon, and, an actual photo of Nixon and Elvis there. But the king wanting to go to the, to the White House because he wants to get this bad. He wants to go undercover as an agent to help the young people of the world with drugs and narcotics. And he's, he's going to Richard Nixon, the only president of the United States that had resigned from office because of Watergate. And the pride, and then, oh my God, one of my favorite actors, Kevin Spacey plays Nixon. He, it, it is a totally serious role, you know, he's, we saw, what was the movie where, where the, oh, it was the one that was with a, with a paper plastic bag that blows around. American Beauty. Oh. He was so good in that. And, you know, because he, and Annette Bening, that was so good. Well, this one, he plays Nixon. And I never have seen, for, I mean, he's playing a straight, serious Nixon. And then Elvis, oh my gosh, he's, he's the king. Every woman that goes near him, you know, it's like with the Beatles had the impact on the teenagers. In this movie, Elvis goes to an airport to fly on his first flight by himself. He left Priscilla and the Colonel back at the back at the estate, and and so he's going. And she asks for his ID finally, and he's got one of these. He he likes to carry guns, and he's into guns and stuff like that. He's got a pistol in his leg. Stuff that you don't know about Elvis, but he he's got that. And then he goes there, and he's got this badge. Like this, some locality gave him a badge, and he's gonna watch this yeah, we're we're gonna watch it now. <laughs> and he, it's so funny. He's got no ID. He's got no ID. He's got no driver's license, passport. But he's got this badge, and she's finally like, okay, like she said, the airlines take the badge, but it gets better. Oh my God, the M and M scene. I just lost it because Nixon, the president likes these M&M's, but only he's allowed to eat the M&M's. They're in the Oval Office. And the King, Elvis likes the M&M's, and you see him go over by the couch, and then all you see is Nixon as they're having this chat, and then you, you can see it's the King reaching into the bowl and spilling, <laughs> spilling the M&M's and grabbing Nixon's, <laughs> Nixon's M&M's. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I thought they were going to throw me off the plane. Because <laughs> it was so funny. Because I'm going to do a little setup for this. Maybe it'll make it the movie watchers guys in my book. But this is Jesus having fun. It's not a metaphysical movie, but it's, it's a great undoing movie. There's so much pride when these two come together. That... And they both... They don't, you know, they both have resistances, and Nixon doesn't even want to meet with him, but it's amazing. You'll see how, how the spirit pulls that one off. And then, you know, whoever thought of this movie, I bet they just laughed all the way, because they knew that Nixon and the king did go to visit Nixon, and so they made this movie, and I can only, only imagine that some of the stuff probably went down like this because, because of the pride and, you know, the king can get away with just about anything. And Nixon's the President of the United States, so nobody, his whole staff is trying to cater to him. And then there's another theme underneath it, which is this very sincere man who, who he, his wife, he's promised his wife something, and now the king is using all of his influence and money to, to, to try to placate him by the... So it's a total 
un un unearthing, exposing of people pleasing and, and why you shouldn't pursue anything in the world. It basically gives you a perfect reason. So anyway, that's that's what's coming up. But I will say that that that's the that's a comedy for us. A comedy is an undoing movie. And in one sense, you know, the undoing's always occurring, but it gets especially funny when it's extreme, like the things that the world says are the biggest strains and tragedies. There's just a light uh, sense of humor behind everything because it's just images and the interpretations of the ego are, aren't true, so that's why it's funny. It's not that the characters themselves are funny, but the undoing has a lightness to it. And so what I like about this is, is Whoever thought up about making this movie must have been laughing before they started because to have Elvis Presley, the king, uh, first he first he's going to go out to Los Angeles and then he's to to get his buddy, a friend of his, um, to come on this mission with him to go to Washington D.C. so he can uh, go undercover as an agent because he's concerned about you know this is the the 70s and the Vietnam War and uh, all kinds of t tumult is happening in the world and and the young people, you know, his heart goes out to help, wanting to help the young people. There's a lot of young people that follow him, but there's a lot of, I mean, the, basically his, Nixon's advisors will say the whole southern part of the United States loves Elvis, the grandparents love Elvis, the people of parents. Elvis, he's so well loved, he's such an icon. It's a little bit like they used to say, like with Marilyn Monroe, she became such a phenomenon that they would say even the the President of the United States is lusting after Marilyn Monroe because she was became so big of an icon. Well Elvis, is, the nickname The King, not King Hussein or the King of Jordan or whatever, or a king in this world, but the king. You know, that was his nickname, was the king. is like the one and only. And so he's so big in terms of rock and roll in the United States, and he's so well known, and yet he's, most people think, well, he, he's not connected at all with politics, but you'll see that he, he, he does have political <laughs> values, aspirations, and he does want to be helpful. And so this is him going to Washington D.C. to um, try to get a federal badge. He wants a federal badge, because he's been used to getting local badges down in Tennessee and with police departments or whatever, where he probably goes to them and just says, I want to be of help. He, he also went into the army, some of you might know. A lot of the ones, Muhammad Ali had been into the army and Frank Sinatra and um, you know, famous, famous people. Uh, and so Elvis was one of them. That was quite a big story, Elvis, when he went to the army. But he's got, he's kind of got a, a patriotic side to him, which is another concept. And of course, uh, the president, you know, is very much involved with leading the nation in the politics. So when you have these two figures and icons come together, it just reminds me of of the line in the Course, Truth does not fight against illusions, nor do illusions fight against the truth. Illusions battle only with themselves. So there's, there's some pride and friction underneath their coming together, which makes it all the more juicy because of, of their status and everything like this. But also, there's the humor of, of it being used to, to undo. Because they both have, you could say, their own kind of entourage. As Nixon has the White House, and like a giant political entourage, and the king is so well known that anywhere he goes, uh, it's going to bring up a stir, and this really funny things like that. The idea of him getting like a badge to be like a narcotics undercover agent, um, 
to do good. It's coming from like a sense of a desire to be helpful, to help the young people who are caught up in alcohol and drugs and, and th influences. And, and then even with the resistance that there seems to be to coming together, mostly on Nixon's part, because the king is wanting to, to go there, then as they get more into it, you know, you find these two where they're it happens a lot where, where they try to find a common ground, but it's still based on their beliefs. And then you start to see them go from this Nixon not even wanting to meet him to their trying to find areas of agreement. But underneath it, it's just hilarious that there's a little bit of one-upmanship <laughs> going on for Nixon and for Elvis, which is one-upmanship is like ego game playing, you know, to try to say, you know who you're dealing with with here. <laughs> and, and that's kind of funny with those two coming together because it's all showing the, the humor of the ego. And especially, obviously, the ego is not real. So all of this is, you know, you can start to transfer it to areas in your life where maybe you don't have to deal with it in such an extreme case, but it still is going to come up in more subtle ways. So I just have a feeling that this is also a nice breather for us. It, we're always so devoted to God and Spirit, and then to see a good undoing movie uh, with the President of the United States and the King, that's kind of a treat. <laughs> that's why I laughed. I mean, I just started off laughing and I just laughed all the way on the flight from L.A. to Salt Lake City. So, Okay, uh, are you ready? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the President and the King. Even the title though, notice Elvis comes first. <laughs> Elvis and Nixon. <laughs> it's just little things like that that I laugh at. Even the title just cracks me up. He can go, he can get out of anything with the same. There's nothing that he can't get out of with the same. His buddy, his good old buddy says that he's got kids because he knows they can get the photos going and it's not going to be serious. He's so famous that he can just pull the fame card anytime he wants. So now he's come and he's tried to check in on an airline for his first time wearing two pistols. And he's, his friend's like, yes, they got kids. So this is, this is what we call people pleasing. Look at the, look at the like sheriff guy. See his cheeks out. One minute he's being interrogated, the next minute it's Elvis. <laughs> and he is scot-free because of just the fame. Which is going to come in to play when we see with Nixon. There's this great fame and popularity. And Nixon's not that popular, but he's elected the President of the United States, so he's got all this electoral power and all this mystique. It's all, it's all an illusion, but that's the fun part of this movie. You get to see the illusion bumping up against itself, you know, and, and to me this is fantastic. But now the Spirit can use you this way too, in the sense we've had all had miracles where things just, just when you think you're in a quote pickle, then that's when Jesus AC Central. <laughs> this is JC Central for Elvis. You know, he's he's being interrogated by the police. And now look what happens. That's JC Central at work there. The guy smiling up there too. Look at the other two. Look at the faces. They are no longer antagonistic police officers. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Next time I'm in town, can you send me a can pause doing that kind of movie stuff. So here's our story. The guy on the left, Elvis's friend, that Elvis called upon for this special favor and got him to come out, he was part of Elvis's entourage and gang, and now at some point he's thinking, I got, I'm too messed up in all this fame and this and this, I, I just need to clear my head and everything, so he's, he's got his partner out there in LA, he's let go of the Bonneville, he's let go of going on these parties, riding with Bonnevilles and, and motorcycles and everything with Elvis and everything. It got the swirl of it all, the fame 
And he's, he's really searching for his integrity, for his purpose. And you got to admire that. Even, I think, with our friend uh, Kristen Marco, you know, she was here, young, she joined with, with Diana, I think we were at uh, Boston, and then came here, poured herself into it, and just was wondering, is there anything else I'm missing out on? I'm young, and this is all seems powerful and everything, but there may be some things that I still need to check out. This guy has been involved with Elvis and everything, and so he's, he really is, is working on his integrity. And you might say that's what's good about this, this is like a subplot in the movie, is he's trying his best to let go of the people pleasing. You know, Elvis trying to buy him this, and buy him that, and buy him anything, so that he'll just be working for Elvis. And he's, he's literally, he qu quit his job at Paramount Studios, and he's come as a favor. <laughs> he quit his job, and Elvis said, I can get you a studio, I can, we can do this, you can ride with me. You know, he'll buy him, <laughs> like he's got so much money he doesn't even know what to do with it. But this is, I really like this plot in here, this guy on the left, this is one who is still working with Elvis, he brought the present for the president, all specially wrapped up from Graceland, and now this guy is, he's our one that's soul searching. He's trying to let go of the people pleasing. And that's a big theme I think in the movie, because the people pleasing is super thick everywhere, and he's trying to to discern and to make decisions that really are helpful and beneficial and find his own calling and integrity. And and then you'll see it later on as it unfolds with his relationship with this woman in California, you know, and she's going to be saying, where are you? She's seen him go off with Elvis, very much like, uh, it was very much like the movie we just, we just watched um, where, uh, What's the movie we just watched? <laughs> hmm? Snowden? So, yeah, Snowden, where Snowden's like, he's got his girlfriend, but he keeps being drawn in by work, his intelligence work, and then he pulls back, and then he's drawn in, and he's pulled back. That's what this guy, he's kind of like Snowden, except instead of it being the government, <laughs> it's Elvis. <laughs> he's drawn into Elvis, and he's trying to wonder about that, you know, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing with my life? Mm -hmm. So that's a, a great subplot, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm doing more of the editing. Ugh, not as glamorous, but I actually did see Faye Dunn like this. With one thing, one thing. We're the only two people who know where he is. He fell asleep. Hey! This would be like Jeffrey oh, losing Kirsten. Yeah. <laughs> He's got one responsibility, just make sure that the body doesn't roll down the hill or something like this and all, all they've got to do is do one thing and he's gone. So now they got to really find him. Did you look in the dining room? Did you look in the dining room? Two more maple bars please. They, they're trying to get him out, but you don't, you don't tell the king what to do. He just says two more Mabel bars, so they immediately move forward and sit down. You don't mess with the king. And these are like two loyal devotees. So this is like his, the king and his entourage. Of course Nixon has his entourage, and that's where it gets funny, when the entourages come together. <laughs> this is a lot of people pleasing, and a lot of power and fame, and all kinds of things going on there, but he just gave him the look, like, two more maple bars. And he even put the original my ass, look back, he doesn't miss a thing. Mm -hmm. Even the, the lady in the, in the back is throwing a little remark and he weaves it right into the dialogue, you know, he's, he's tuned in here. He's fearless, yeah. 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 You can meet everyone. Yeah. Are you sure it's him? I know it sounds crazy, but he literally just walked up to the gate. Look, just out of curiosity, what is a federal agent at large? No such thing. Uh, actually, sir, I, I looked into it. There, there is such a thing. No such thing. <laughs> no such thing. But 
is there something else that we can give him? Uh, the, go- or, <laughs> the government's so got some. He's got a federal agent. Federal agent at large. <laughs> there is such a thing. Elvis is like, he wants to help. And so he's coming right into the top. Which he figures, why not? But, even Elvis has a backup plan. Plan B, should his going to the top not work. Which is fantastic too. He's, he's prepared for everything. The public saw that President Nixon has a relationship with the... <laughs> he gets the eye and me. Everybody, everybody looks at it because it's like it was there. But then when he started to be a little bit condescending with Elvis, like you can get by a badge and everything, he doesn't like. He doesn't like that even with with the colonel or with anybody that tells him how to spend his money or anything like that. He feels it's condescending. If I earn my money, I should be able to spend it. If I want to help, I, I, he was really trying to go directly there, but then the guy with said, we'll get Marianne to take you out and buy a badge on the street or something. It was like, so there goes his plan B. <laughs> his, his plan B. Now he's going to try to, he, he's, he's still waiting for that call from, from Nixon. A souvenir or something? Probably not. For my pop. And uh, Mr. Schilling, do you think it'll be possible for us to get a picture with Mr. Presley? Okay, stop Who it the here. Fuck it? <laughs> 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 See, you can you can be ninety percent sure you can you can set everything up, but then you've got to go get one last yes. That's the way it works in the White House. It works around here. It's the way it works with JC Central. You can pray, do whatever you want, as much as you want, and then you've got to go for the big yes to get it from JC Central. Now in the White House, they do whatever they do, and da 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 da. And then now this is a meeting with Nixon, so now they eventually <laughs> have to go and bring the letter in and and present it to him. And they're saying it's, it's a ninety percent chance, but Nixon. <laughs> He's not, he's not impressed. You see, again, this is his, his attitude here. Actually, he did, sir. Mr. Presley made an unscheduled appearance. Mr. President, Julie's on the Oh! Julie. <laughs> That'll get him up. The only thing that gets him up. He's very old-fashioned, very traditional. Julie's on the line. See him squirm to get up from his newspaper. This is people pleasing to the max. This is how you motivate the president. Family. My Julie. Sweet one. <laughs> well, I did. Hello, Mr. President. Good morning. It's funny, you can't say honor with to Nixon, because Nixon doesn't have a, an honorable, I mean, he's the only president to resign after a scandal in the history of the United States from the Watergate. And so he's looking in the mirror and he's re- trying to see what will come out and honor won't come out. So this is kind of interesting, you know, you, you have to be authentic. He's got to be authentic. He can't. People please. He himself is going through all the things that people pleasing tendencies, but he's like, no, uh, no. So he's kind of rinsing out the people pleasing so he can glide in there and be himself, which is so important. So important. Did you know I had a twin brother, Mr. President? Identical. (laughs) Now, if you don't mind. So watch it, you see the games that are going on, the compliments come in for the president, and he's like, hmm. It takes two to make a good looking baby. <laughs> 
saying, I'm a good looking judge. The compliments, compliments, and then now he's told his guy to come in and to take him out of there, but he doesn't want to be taken out. He wants a photograph with Elvis. And where does Elvis go? No pictures today. You know, just like, this is how it works in the world between countries, between spouses. Angelina Jolie filed for divorce today from Brad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and she wants custody of all six children. $400 and Brad wants the children some too. So you see, this is, this is how it goes in the whole world. It's just images, images, images. That's what the, con it's a conflict of images. Whenever there's a conflict, there's an identification with an image. Jesus says, whenever you feel the need to become defensive about anything, you have identified yourself with an illusion. And so that's what you can see the subtleties playing out here between the king and the president, but that's, it happens with every day, any moment when there's an identification with the ego, that's where the, the upset arises, the defensiveness, the conflict, the awkwardness, the whatever. It always is coming down from, from that, and this is just playing it out. You can just see the little nuances, you know, he t sends him away, no, again, no, no, no to his the guy who came to get him and now, and this guy, look what he's saying as he's going out, like, he's already told the king, like, the, the Dr. Pepper is only for the president, the M&M's are only for the president, he walks away, uh, now he's come and he, it's gone out of control. And then, uh, and then the king turns around and says, no picture, not today. So, it's just beautiful for pop, 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 popping. The self-concept. It's a classic. He's out of control and he has a gun. <laughs> <laughs> right. He, he did, they didn't get this pistol I hit. Right. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Fuck. <laughs> now here, this guy's recalling he's supposed to be meeting his girlfriend's father for dinner. So he's in the middle of this whole Elvis thing, and he's getting a prompt, mm -hmm. an integrity prompt, mm -hmm. on this very day right there in the White House, which is great, because that's the subplot of this whole thing, which is really the main plot, that that's the way it will work, even in the, mat in the middle of a big swirl where the ego tries to make things seem all important in the world. What's more important than integrity? Really? Could there be anything more important? And he's like, I'm supposed to be meeting my girlfriend's father for dinner. And that's on the west coast. She's out in, in LA, where he used to work, Fairmont. And she, she was testing him on the phone, like, are you, you know, you're, you're going back. Going back to this addiction where Elvis buys you out and you don't keep your word. It was the same thing in Snowden. That Snowden's girlfriend really had to, Lindsay kept coming to him like, wait a minute, what, what are you saying? It's, you know, it's top secret, it's top secret. Elvis is using some of the same words, top secret, top secret. Just for, even with the president, it would just be you and I and J. Edgar Hoover, the only, the only ones that know this top secret thing. So, so really it's, this is like, Francis has been saying, this is the year of the exposure, mass exposure this year. And this is great, because here in the movie, this is the guy that he's going to... And so then, and Elvis has a friendship and a love of him, so then Elvis is going to even have to make some decisions in terms of uh, what he's going to do to deal with this guy's prompt for keeping his integrity. So it's really, it gets very interesting here. I'm supposed to be meeting my girlfriend's father for dinner.
Yeah, I guess the, the thing that strikes me the most is that when you see that it, it in such an extreme, extreme way, then you can start to see that how that's all that this world is. It's just made to distract the mind away from from being truly helpful, from from truly stepping into whatever role or uh, you might say part that the spirit gives. Because when the mind's sound asleep and it's addicted to dreaming, then the only way that it can move towards seeing that it's dreaming is is to be so fully given over to the spirit to use however the spirit would use it, because that's how the mind comes into this awareness of the divine order, that everything's working perfectly. Without giving yourself really over to the spirit, then those just are just words in the course. But when you kind of say, okay, I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere, like that prayer in the workbook, what would you have me say? Where would you have me go? You know, it's like, that's like a prayer that's really saying, I, I give to you, I give back my mind to use as you would decide. And then the spirit takes it from there and then there's like a loosening that occurs. And what a relief to not have to play all those games, like they really acted them out. All the schmoozing up and the, I'll do this for you and the, and the bargains and do this and what about this and then this, you know, it just keeps going on and on and on. It's very tiring to play those ego games and all that one-upsmanship and all that, the bargaining, you know, it's what the whole world is. It's, everything's a, a bargain, everything's a, an agreement that holds the mind into personhood, so, yeah, that was funny, that was funny. Not overtly metaphysical, but then when you see, see how the, it can be used, you can get stuck in it, then it's like, you start to say, okay, I don't want that, I don't want to be going through the motions. And that's what we also felt it was great in the, with the Beatles movie, Eight Days a Week. There came a point where they were touring and touring and touring. And there came a point where they just felt like they were going through the motions. And that took a, like, a correction. You were mentioning the adjust, Adjustment Bureau. It's like we're, we're living out our own Adjustment Bureau. But instead of the Chairman, it's the Holy Spirit. And instead of it involving personal motives, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a personal motive. It's a memory of the Christ, memory of true identity. So it's using the mind to rinse the mind. It's quite amazing to think that everything of this world is only part of a rinse to free the mind from all beliefs and limitations. The constant that's going on. So you can do your book, I Married a Mystic, where I was going to South America and what a rinse that was, but it's like it was a it was a given kind of thing to first get rings and then have very simple bows, mm -hmm. and then to go down and, yeah, all that got flushed up in Argentina, and my friend Maria and her husband going through a divorce, and her, him leaving for another woman and so forth, and, and how sad Maria's voice was, but how the Spirit just used the symbols Oh, we're coming, we've already bought our tickets. Oh, it's not good, it's a terrible time, don't come. No, no, it's, we got our tickets. Oh no, please David, it's just terrible, it's terrible. We're on our honeymoon. Oh, 
well, okay then. <laughs> That's, that was the, the word that opened the door for Maria. And then when we, we got down there, the more the, you had all the thoughts and the things building up underneath, that the honey, even the honeymoon word contrasted with your version of a honeymoon. <laughs> but that was all part of a popping too. It was a big burp, big pop, yeah. But to think that that's what the Spirit's using everything for, nothing ever happens to you. Everything is always happening for you. Nothing has ever happened to you. Because J.C. Central's been behind everything without exception, and everything in your entire life happened for your mind, for the sleeping mind that needs to wake up. It was all for the good. There was never any loss or betrayal, there was ever, never any real darkness. It was just interpreted. The ego was reading all these false meanings to things. And then it just, finally it just keeps rinsing, rinsing, rinsing. Rinsing the mind into salvation. I do not know the thing I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going, or how to look upon myself or upon the world. That's salvation. You give yourself over, you get in right in the middle of the rinse and you go, whoa, this is pretty full on, and then, no, not over yet, more rinsing. You've got to become completely clueless. Partial cluelessness is frustrating. It's complete cluelessness. Peter Sellers being there, cluelessness. That, that pops the cork. You have to, just like Chauncey Gardner, reach a state of mind where you can honestly say, I like to watch. Honestly. That's all you do. You're a watcher of the world. <laughs> What's your role? What part do you play? I like to watch. That's the key. Or in the wise words of the angels through Resta Bur Burnham, there's no need to moan and boo-hoo. Laugh, laugh. Remember to laugh. Remember it's only a dream. Ego schmigo. Wake up amigo. Stop crying and have a good laugh. Wow, what lyrics. <laughs> I haven't heard that song for a few, quite a few years. I guess it came out in Holland. That's funny. It's good to have a comedy. I'm doing the self-concept comedy.
Did it say there at the end? Was it saying something about the, was that the most requested image, image photograph from the National Archives of, mm -hmm. of the History of the United States? Oh, wow. The most requested image. <laughs> Elphus and Nixon. <laughs> People were curious. There is some grace in, in the way it's used. It is like love at that time in, of the people infiltrated the White House or something. Like it's, it's yeah. funny, the symbol, because my, my dad was very famous and going around was like going around like that when I was a very small child. And people felt blessed. I mean, they felt absolutely blessed. And a bit, a bit like... The elves had this ability to just answer whatever it was. Mm -hmm. I would see that that would be given, and it it wasn't coming from my father. It's it's more like watching us on tour. There's something the spirits like coming through. Something's been given. So it's like I don't know whether it's just it's like all that love that's been poured out from the mind is reflected back in a way that it can be accepted or something. I don't know mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah. It's something. Yeah, I think it's interesting how how the ego builds up the fame and and it builds up all kinds of things. But yeah, you can look out throughout history. Like El Elvis had, there was a humbleness and an equality that flowed through him that he could connect. He wasn't afraid of connecting with the fans or anyone because the humbleness was still there underneath. He was he could feel he could how easy it was to get lost in the object, the, the thing. The Beatles went through that, we just watched that amazing eight days a week where they were, they could feel the Beatles and Beatlemania got blown way out of proportion, but they, they were searching for that, that camaraderie, that love, that fellowship that was always there. They always felt it, but it was just this other thing kind of blew up and, and then they finally sometimes tried to feed the other thing and then they felt they were going through the motions and they felt terrible. It was George Harrison, the first one, that said, when, when are we stopping this touring? And John joined him and then eventually they all, they would have to all feel it, they all felt to stop, stop with the touring, it was too much. And they were going through the motions, even the, the first film was great, but then already the second film was a bit of going through the motions, everything came so fast. And then, of course, there's stories like Lady Di, you know, she was so put out into prominence by marrying Prince, the Prince William, but that, that school teachers and that simplicity and that big-hearted openness and that connecting with the everyday people shone through the whole symbol, it seemed to ruffle the, the the whole royalty. She was like out of the box. And in some ways Elvis would go out of the box from the colonel and, you know, he was aware too. He was even going, his Enneagram sign, I think, eight and, you know, plans an impact on the greater stage, but, but, you know, knowing that it could have a, more of a, fatalistic turn, and that's exactly how it went for him. 
for Gandhi, for example, he had this deep love and non-violence and equality and so on and so forth, and never held a, a single political position or role, was, but was highly impactful in a huge scale. And yet, you know, he, he himself was aware, even though he never held a political role, that when Walker, the journalist from the America that asked him, you know, said he was quite an ambitious fellow, and he said, hope not, I hope not, and then um, somebody said to him one time, some member of the press, are you a, a, a saint trying to become a politician? Gandhi said, oh no, I'm a politician trying to become a saint. He was aware of his own thoughts, his own identification with India, his own desire to see India freed from the British. He knew, even though he never held a political role, he was dealing with a political concept in his mind. So he turned it around, he said, oh no, I'm not a saint trying to become a politician, I'm a politician trying to become a saint, trying to open up to self-realization. So it's, yeah, it's very subtle, but it is beautiful the way the symbols and images can be used. Even Jesus had to deal with some degree of notoriety in his day, by the end, you know, because he's quite infamous to some and important to others, but it really wasn't who he was, who he is. But it is a good reminder that yeah, no matter how it goes, you can always have humbleness and grace. And yeah, that's, that was his home in Tennessee, Graceland. Mm -hmm. And nice that the king is humble, or on the road to humility. He certainly had his own struggles with a lot of things. And Priscilla too, yeah, marrying the king, yeah, there's been movies made about that. She said, I went from just being a woman to the most hated woman in America, <laughs> just, just by marrying the king, because <laughs> of the whole idea of possession and all those things. Yeah. It's quite interesting. And I feel like that's kind of, it, it, this is a year, like Francis was saying, a year of exposure, but I think what comes with that too is this, just what we talked about on the show this morning, that, that you start to come into the experience that there is no external world. And with that experience, then you let go of all need to react and respond to the world. You know, you get little opportunities every day to, to see if you'll give a rise or give a reaction to something when there's really nothing actually to react to. It's just that all the reactions are generated in the mind. It was interesting when Deanna went back to visit her mother and, you know, for a pretty pretty good stretch of time. So how's your life? How's it going? Do you, do you have your own money? Do you have, you know, like, do you have the things that a young woman should have? And so it was like a little test, to, is there anything there to react to? Yeah, I have everything I need. I've got the latest iPhone. I've got an iMac. 
I got a purpose, a function, what more could I need? Do you have a partner? Do you have this? Do you, you know, all the questions of the world. Do you, are you meeting up with the standards of, of the world? And then you have to go inside this to realize that, that you don't and never will relate to the standards of the world. That there is nothing there really to relate to. So, and then you let the Spirit graciously answer answer the questions, which is part of shining the light, you know, whatever. You, it's kind of fun to see what words will be given, if any, and what words will pop out, because that's part of the, the grace. It's part of the grace of it all, the mind training.